Take your Bible, if you would, please, and make your way to the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, please. Mark chapter 6 will be our text this morning as we're continuing our study in the book of Mark. I'm trying to determine if the study is going quickly or slowly. I'm not sure. I just know that I'm enjoying the study. And uh, I hope and pray that you are as well. I do believe, as I stand here right now, that today will be the last time I'm in the book of Mark for about four or five weeks. Um, Next week, we move into missions preaching for the 8th, the 15th, the 22nd. On the 29th of um, the month, we have our anniversary Sunday. And then the first Sunday of October, we have a very special service planned that I'm really praying and highlighting as an evangelistic service. And I want you just to put a note down in your mind somewhere. If, you, if you've been desiring to invite somebody that's a non-believer to church and you wanted them to hear the gospel, I'm going to put special emphasis in prayer on the first Sunday of October. It will be unique. It will be um, a little bit of a surprise to you. But I do believe it will be a wonderful evangelistic service. Uh, that you will want to want to be part of, and it will be at 8:30 and 11 as well. And then, after that, <clears throat> we'll come back to Mark chapter number six. Also, um, I need you to find First Thessalonians chapter four, if you would, and just put something there. I I need First Thessalonians chapter four today, so that you know that I'm an honest pastor. Pastor, we already believe you're an honest pastor. Well, good. I appreciate that. To me, an honest pastor is somebody who preaches the word of God in season and out of season. An honest pastor is somebody who just presents to his people, thus saith the Lord. And there will be a section in here today in the message um, that will need that. I would also say that if you have a child under the fifth grade, some of this material, as you will see, probably is a little bit above them, and you might want to you might want to be careful with that. I did not intend in my own study to preach a message on missions today, but as I study the passage of Scripture, that is exactly what I am doing today. I'm preaching what I believe to be an introductory message to our missions month. You see the title of the series on the screen. I want you to see the title of the message. The title of the message this morning is The Great Shepherd. Of course, we know from the Old Testament and we know from the New Testament, we know from the personalness of our own lives that the Lord Jesus is the great shepherd. He is the shepherd of our souls. Matter of the fact, if you've come to the Lord Jesus for salvation and found him to be your shepherd, would you say amen? So we know that. The message is, I don't want to say backwards today, but I'm going to start from the end of the message, and then I'm going to work my way to it. The end of the message today begins in Mark chapter 6 in verse number 30. And the conclusion of it is broken up into two groups of people. If you look in chapter 30, verse number 1, or chapter 30, the third word there, you see the word apostles. This would be group number 1. And when you get down to verse number 34, you will see so much people or the congregation. Let me read you the conclusion of our passage and then let me preach you there. And when we get done with the message today... I want you to be saved by the great shepherd. If you're not saved, I want you to be secured by the great shepherd. I want you to have the same heart as the great shepherd. And even though we live in a chaotic world, an insane world right now, what a security to know that our God is seated on the throne. And what a security to know that we can have sanity from the word of God. Amen. All right, in verse number 30, it says the apostles gathered themselves together. They did this after they had been sent out two by two. They had been going there and they had been sent out to witness. They'd been sent out to give the gospel. And now they're coming back. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. 
And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place. It's not a place of sand. It's a remote place. And what did he want them to do? He wanted them to do what? Rest a little bit. Now, this is the Lord Jesus, and he's calling them away from what they've been doing, and he sees and he knows as a shepherd that they need rest. Why do they need rest? The rest of the verse says, For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Right? They had been working, they had been serving, they had been doing those things, and now they find themselves in a place where they're physically exhausted and they haven't had any leisure time. I like knowing that eating is a leisure time. That's my new hobby. I've just adopted it from the Word of God. In verse number 32, it says, And they departed into a desert place by ship privately, and the people, the people, the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran a foot thither out of all the cities, and out went them, which means they ran faster than the ship. They got to the place before the ship did. And they came together unto him. And when Jesus, and Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with what, class? Compassion. That word moved is the word empathy. It's, it's pity. It's brokenness. It's burden. It's love. It's, consu it, it's, it's consumed with, with desire for them. I mean, in his gut, man, he's moved with compassion toward these people. Why? Because, in verse number 34, they were as sheep not having a shepherd. The Bible says at the end of verse 34, and he began to do what to them? Teach them. Two groups of people here that the Lord had to shepherd in this moment. His own apostles and what we would consider the peoples of the world. For the apostles, we would consider the born again child of God, the Christian, the church. These were people who believed upon him. They, they needed shepherding. And by the way, even Christian people, we need shepherding from the Lord. We need protection from the Lord. We need to be secured by the Lord. He feels, he feels this need to pull them away from preaching, away from working, and to spend some time with him for rest. I would submit to you it's an awful reason why he had to do that. The second group of people that he has to shepherd are people that do not know him as Lord. They do not believe him as Lord. These are people that are burdened with disease. These are people that are burdened with death. These are people that are burdened with different problems. They don't know the Lord to help them in these areas. And the Lord Jesus just looks at them at lost, as, as sheep without a shepherd, which means there's nobody there to provide hope. There's nobody there to provide leadership in their life. There's nobody to provide protection or guidance. They're just having to figure out life by themselves. You have the church that needed to be shepherded by his presence, and you have those that do not know him that he desires to be shepherding. And the reason that he needs to be their shepherd is insane, man. It's insane. And when you come back to verse number 14 of the chapter, I need to preach you the reason why. In verse number 14, you meet a man who's haunted. You meet a man who is haunted in his soul. He's so haunted in his soul that he is assured of, of, of a reincarnation process of a man. This man is haunted in his soul because of a heinous, heinous crime and act that he commits. He commits this heinous crime and act as the consequence of a hedonistic, H-E-D-O-N-I-S-T-I-C, hedonistic, a godless, sexual, sensual, wicked moment. So you have a haunted man who committed a heinous act out of a hedonistic moment. 
How is he haunted? Pick up in verse 14 if you would. You meet the man. His name is King Herod. He is the king of the land. He is the highest in charge at this time uh, for the Jewish people. And King Herod heard of him in verse 14. The him is Jesus. As a matter of fact, Mark tells us, for his name, Jesus' name, was spread abroad. You know it was spread abroad because of all of the work that we've been looking at that the Lord Jesus has done. And he, this is Herod, said that John the Baptist was risen from where, class? From the dead. And therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Uh, Herod has heard about what Jesus is doing, and, and uh, Herod is haunted by John the Baptist. I'll show you why in just a moment. And he thinks that it's not Jesus. He thinks that John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and, and the works that are being done are being done through John the Baptist. This is a man haunted in the depth of his soul. If you look at verse 15, others try to talk him out of this. Others said, no, this is Elijah. Elias in your Bible, Elijah. Others said that it is a prophet or is one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, and when you read the Greek, he said it over and over and over. It's him. It's him. It's him. I know it's him. It's him. It's him. It's him. I know it's him. It's him. Almost in a haunting type of, of repetition it is John whom, in verse 16, I did what? I cut his head off. I beheaded him. He is risen from the dead. John the Baptist, it's important that you understand who he is at this moment in time. He is the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. He is the great prophet that announced the coming of the Lord. Jesus himself said there was none greater among women than John the Baptist. He was a righteous, holy, unblameable man. He was a man that had God's power. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of truth. In that conviction in truth... He finds himself in a position, look if you would at verse 17, the reason that Herod is haunted because of this heinous act, verse 17, for Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake. Herodias is introduced to us here in her, as, as, uh, in her, her femininity and she is described, Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's who, class? Why? And if you look at verse number 17, for he had married her. So you find in the, re in the telling of this moment that Herod has a thing for his brother's wife. We would call that infidelity. We would call that sin. Here, Philip's wife has a thing for her brother-in-law, and they, they, they want to get together, and they want to be married. Problem with that is that even though you're the king, and you can set the law, and really you answer to nobody, every man or every woman ever born will answer to God. And so when you come to verse number 18, you will find, it says, For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. So you have a preacher here who had some guts. You had a preacher here who had some conviction. You had a preacher here who had enough courage to go to the face of the king and say, what you're doing is a sin against God. The king could look and say, no, I've decreed it to be law, but I'm going to tell you something. Where man's law disobeys God's law, God's law is truth. Okay? And God's law supersedes. So if God's law says that it's wrong for a man to marry a man... And the law of the land says it's right for a man to marry a man. God's word is true. Okay. So 
We're talking here not much different in our society. You had a king who wants what he wants. You have a king who has the ability to establish man-made authority. The problem is in the book of Leviticus chapter 18, verse number 16, God said, this is wrong, this is a sin, this cannot be. John the Baptist, obeying God's law, comes to the king and says, you can't do this. It's a sin against God. Let me just stop right here and say, I pray that God would give his church on the earth this type of conviction. Conviction is something that ought to be in every born-again Christian's life. We are to be men and women of conviction. We call it personal conviction. That's fine. Our convictions should not come from our opinion. Our convictions should come from the word of God. If God's word says it's right, it's right. If God's word says it's wrong, it's wrong. Okay. So here you have a man who has enough conviction to go in front of the king and say, you're sinning against God, you can't have this. We know from the text that it didn't affect the king. The king just dismissed him and his word. And not only did the king dismiss him, because the word was persistent and the conviction was persistent and the confrontation was persistent, the king has him arrested and thrown in jail. There's another party. There's a thing, an adage out there says it takes two to do what? To tango. Let's meet the second part of this dance. Her name is Herodias. Look, if you would, in verse 19. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him. And she would and, and, and would have killed him, but she could not. Herodias here, she takes the confrontation of John very differently than the king. I'll show you in a moment. The king dismisses and imprisons, but the king still entertains John. Herodias developed what we call a grudge. I hope and pray you are not a grudge keeper. Grudges are against God's word. No born-again Christian should, should allow a grudge in their life. This grudge went deep into a rage. When you study that word, it means that Herodias had it in for John the Baptist. She couldn't get her hands on him immediately, but oh, she waited for the day when he was going to get his. And as the days went by, and every time John the Baptist's name is mentioned, that fire that was down in there of guilt and or, or, of rage and of grudge and of hatred just lit. And that woman just could not wait for her day. By the way, little test for a born-again Christian. Pastor, how do I know if I'm carrying a grudge against somebody or if I'm just... If I'm just uh, angry at them or whatever. How do I know if it went that deep? If you weep with them when they rejoice and you rejoice when they weep, you're probably carrying a grudge. Okay, the Bible says weep with them that weep and rejoice with them that rejoice. Amen? So if your brother or sister has good news and you hate the fact that they have good news and they're rejoicing and you're burning and singeing, you probably have a grudge. When they have something terrible happen in their family and you're happy and you're joyful and you don't know how to weep, you probably are carrying a grudge. Let me say it again. The Bible teaches forgiveness for the child of the living God. Amen? So if you're a born-again Christian... You can't let that develop deep in your soul like that. That can't happen. There ought to be a forgiving spirit. Herodias is not a born-again Christian. She's a very wicked woman, and she lets this thing fire within her. Notice the king's response um, in verse number 20. For Herod feared John. He had a little bit of reverence and respect for John, knowing that he, John, was a just man and a holy man, and observed him, and when he heard him, he did many things, and heard him how, class? Gladly. So, so King, King Herod, he didn't carry the grudge. 
he kind of carried a reverence for John the Baptist. He would entertain John the Baptist. He would entertain John the Baptist's message. He would have intellectual stimulation. He would have conversation with him. It was always a delight to be in his presence. The problem is he never accepted the message of John the Baptist, which was the gospel. To King Herod, the relationship with John the Baptist was all intellectual, and it was not in his heart. Let me stop there and say, if the gospel is here and the gospel is not here, that separates your eternal destiny. If the gospel is only in your mind and you've never accepted in your heart, then, then you, it's with the heart where you believe. People come and they listen and they hear Pastor Hunter gladly because he's the best preacher they know. <laughs> My friend, I love that you do that. But this is not about Pastor Tom putting on a show. This is about Pastor Tom putting on to you the gospel of Jesus Christ so that you can receive in your heart. That word observe carries with it the idea that John, that King Herod protected John the Baptist. He was entertained mentally with John the Baptist, but he, he never accepted him, the message in his heart. And so, but he kept him away from Herodias because he knew Herodias hated the guy. And so he's got him over here and he's trying to keep and work all this out. But Herodias is here and she's burning and singeing with grudge and waiting her time. Look, if you would, at verse number, uh, where was I? Verse number 21. Thank you. And when a convenient day was come, they're telling you the story, that Herod on his what day? His birthday. Made a supper, had a party. To his lords, his high captains, his chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and she danced. I'm going to say a little bit about this licentious sexual moment. And she danced. And it pleased Herod. And them that sat with him. And the king said unto the little girl, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto what class? The half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And her mother said, I want the head of that preacher, I want the head of John the Baptist. The Bible says in verse 25, the little girl came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. The king never saw it coming. In verse number 26, it says the king was exceeding sorry. That doesn't mean that he was repentful toward God. He was just sorry in a very humanistic way. He was sorry, watch this, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. Are you kidding me? And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded from his wicked, hedonistic, drunk-filled, lap situation dance, he gives an, an order to kill John the Baptist. And he commanded his head to be brought. And the executioner went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. Let's stop right there. I'm preaching you to the moment of the great shepherd. I'm preaching you to the moment where the apostles are comforted and cared for by the presence of the Lord Jesus. 
And I'm preaching you to the moment where the peoples of that land see in the Lord Jesus a shepherd. To understand the brokenness of the Lord Jesus in this moment, this little incident gives you a picture of the insanity of the times. I look at this and I think, what a wicked moment. But I would share with you that we live in a wicked day today. Think about the peoples of the land and think about their king and what type of life the political system had put for them. They're out here in the day-to-day of their life and the political establishment, and I'm not making any reference in this to our political establishment, I'm just saying the political establishment, the leader, the one that should be caring for them is sleeping with his brother's wife. And, and dismissing righteousness and anybody that gets in the way of that is susceptible to, to death. The second question I would have is, where are the scribes? Where are the Pharisees? They were to be the religious leaders. They were the ones that were in charge of the written word of God. They were the ones that were in charge of seeing that the people heard from God and obeyed God and followed God. Where, where were they? Where, where, where were the families to step up? I'm saying that this moment of time that Jesus comes to in a compassionate moment of reckoning that the people need a shepherd and his apostles is, is because the days were just filled with hedonism. I would submit to you our days are filled with hedonism today. We live in a wicked world. It's a wicked thing to call something unrighteous that God calls righteous. Now, I'm your pastor and you love me, right? And I love you. And I realize this may not be popular. But God created us male and female. And it's insane to think otherwise. God created marriage in a direction. It's God's word. The laws of the land say one thing. God's word says another. What are we going to go by? We go by God's word. But we're seeing hedonism expand. Um, Let's talk about the streaming platforms of our society. I'm appalled with what's on, on television for our children to watch or what's on our phones for us adults to watch. Appalled at the, at the elitism, the, the Hollywood, the direction the world is going. It's moving so quickly in just a complete hedonistic way. And in the movement of that, people are left. They're told that this Bible is not God's word, but we believe it's God's word. They're told there's no such thing as a God, but we believe that there is a true and living God who created us and who saves us. They're told that they're God themselves. They're told, they, and, and, and there's, there's no light, there's no word. That's what the church is supposed to do. When you study the scripture, help me, Lord. I don't want to be right. When you study the scripture and you study the parties in the scripture, Most of the time when the world throws a party in the scripture, righteousness got killed. Okay? Ahasuerus throws a party and he wants his wife to come out and dance sexual before all the men. She says, you're a fool. By the way, wives, anytime your man asks you to be sexual for anybody other than him, you should look at him and say no. 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 Belteshazzar throws a party, and the alcohol is in there, and they're so drunk, he wants to bring the, 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 the glasses from the, tr- from the temple, and he wants to drink in the Jews' God's glasses unto his God, and in that drunken stupor, a hand shows up on the wall and writes his death sentence, the guy's dead in the morning. I want to say something about partying. A lot of times when Pastor Hunter says something, if you've known me a long time, 
If I feel like I'm giving you my opinion, I step over here and I say I'm giving you my opinion. Have anybody ever seen me do that before? Okay. I'm not doing that today. I'm standing right here, which I have a sacred reverence for this desk. Now, I'm careful. But I'm telling you that when the world throws a party, believers should not attend. And I'm watching believers be destroyed and righteousness be destroyed because we are joining the world in its hedonism through, through fellowship and through participation. The text carries with it dancing. And I want to talk about dancing because I go on the internet. I don't, I don't really have Facebook and I don't have Instagram and I don't have all that kind of stuff. I just can't take it. But people that I know and pay a lot of money to have it. And I, I'm watching our, our little girls dancing and they shouldn't be doing that. Since dancing is in the text, let's talk about it. Is the Bible against all dancing? No. 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 There was a dancing unto the Lord. Isaac and Rebecca, as husband and wife, sported in the field. You can read into that a dancing. I don't think the Bible has any problem with a husband and a wife dancing together. Now, I just made all of the men mad because your wife's been wanting you to take ballroom dancing lessons, <laughs> and you're going to use me. I understand that, okay? You want to dance with your spouse? Great. Go ahead and do it. Pastor, do you dance with Beverly? We tried one time, and then we laughed so hard we stopped. <laughs> I, I think if you want to get dressed up and you want to go out and you want to dance as far as in a setting that is a, a formal, a fun, a celebrating way with your spouse, I think you can do that. But when your dancing becomes licentious, You've crossed a line. What is licentious? Licentious is an inordinate sexual direction. The Bible calls it, and here's why I wanted, needed you to make sure I was an honest pastor, the lust of concupiscence. It's the stirring up of sexual desire in another or having your sexual desire stirred up. And let's just be real honest about this. The only person that should be stirring your sexual desire is your spouse. Amen. Amen. <laughs> okay. Mom, dad, why, why are you teaching your kids how to dance? Now, I know you have ballet, and I know you have Innocent things, and it can be a sport, and so on. But I want to challenge you as your pastor from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Please turn there if you would. Hold your hand and mark. We're coming back. Look at verse number 3. Are you there? Okay, for this is the will of God. That's pretty straightforward, right? The will of God. Even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. That's, a, that's sexual sin. That's outside the bonds of marriage. Verse number four. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. That means work your body. That means present your body. We are to possess our vessel in, say that word please, sanctification and what? Sanctification is a set apart unto the Lord. And honor would be an honor to the Lord. The next verse is huge. 
not in the lust of concupiscence. Okay. So your little girl or your little boy that knows the Lord, they're to use their body in sanctification and honor to the glory of the Lord. Can we agree that's what the Bible says? Okay. One of the ways that God's people are being deceived is, 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 is in little by little. Well, Pastor, we're, we're doing dance for cheer. Okay, let's talk about that. Why don't you come down with me next week to the Miami Dolphin football game? Let's get our seats right in front of the cheerleaders and you sit there with me. Let's, let's reduce it. I went to a high school football game in Broward County. Others went to a Christian. This is public school. Others went to a Christian school. The cheerleading girls were all right there, right in front of us. Those little girls moved in such a, a licentious way, it was terrible. They, not little girls, these were high school girls. And they would make the line, and the one little girl, whenever it was her turn, she would come and she would go center stage, and she would move in a way that was just not right. It was ungodly. I looked at Beverly, she looked at me, I thought, we're in big trouble and then I began to look at the front row. And standing up on the bar of the front row, looking over, were all the mothers. You go, girl. <laughs> Herodias is the mother that sent her little girl to lap dance a king and every man in there to get what she wanted. I want, I'm like, I can't believe this. Then I looked into the crowd to all the men. And many of the men were standing. And they're glaring. And they're watching. When the world goes to party... The believer needs to stand up for Jesus. Where are you, Dad? Where are you, leader of your home? Where are you, Dad? I'm talking to the men. All those women were pushing the girls. And I'm not accusing our ladies. But sometimes the home needs Dad to say, no, you're not. Pastor, my wife won't let me. That's another message. <laughs> Why am I saying this? Watch how this all comes together now. It's an insane moment in Mark chapter 6. The king is wicked as hell. It's supported, magnified. If the king is doing it, probably the, it'll pass down. The religion system is quiet. Nobody with conviction. Nobody providing leadership. The one man that does stand up gets his head cut off. And the Lord comes over here to all the people. And the people are so broken. They're so desperate. They're so lost. They so desire truth and health. And, so, and they heard about this man, Jesus, and they're so hungry for it that they outrun his boat to the other side, desperately waiting on him. Now listen, Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. Forty days later, he ascended up to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Do you believe that? Okay. And he left you here. Because the people of the world need a witness about Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. From you.
But I think we're kind of swayed a little bit in our attention. And we're more interested in some of the things the world has to offer than being a testimony for the Lord Jesus. We are to possess our vessel, our body, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust. So people can see. And they, they, they shouldn't look at the little girl and say, they should look at our kids and say, there's something different about that kid. That kid has something my kid doesn't have. That kid has, and we can tell them, that kid has Jesus. Because the greatest need of the human heart is Jesus Christ. Okay. Did we get the message? Right. Please, men, don't hate me going out. If your wife wants to take you dancing, go with your wife. Just do what I did. Step on her feet about four or five times. (laughs) And she'll gladly take somebody else. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, God, it was an insane scenario when Jesus told his disciples, come be with me a little bit. I love that because in the day in which we live in, in an insane world, it's wonderful to know the shepherd, the Lord Jesus. It's wonderful to know your provision and your care. It's wonderful to come to the word of God and find sanity in an insane world. And then, Lord, the peoples of the world, it was football yesterday, and I watched those stadiums filled with people, and I was cheering and having a great time. And and then I thought, do they know you, God? If they died today, where would they go? Then I was reminded of our message today. You left your church. You left us as Christians in this world so people could hear about you. And from the insaneness of wickedness, they could be brought to righteousness. As sheep, they could have a shepherd for their soul. It's not time for us to be partying with the world. It's not time for us to be distracted. It's time for us to be salt and light. Oh, man, use us this way, Lord. With heads bowed and eyes closed and nobody looking. Christian, where are you today? In the message, where are you? I hope not distracted by the things of the world. I hope you realize the world needs the Lord. Your life is being possessed in sanctification and in honor and under the Lord. Right? Right? When you're in people's presence, there's something different about that guy, something different about that lady. It's the Lord. Men, Are you providing leadership? If you are a lady and you're without a man and you're the head of your home, is your leadership godly following that direction? Please. Maybe you're here today and you hear the messages and they're in your head, but they need to be in your heart right where you sit. You could ask the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Change me. I want to be saved. I accept you in my heart. If you would do that, call upon him. The Bible says you'll have salvation. Oh, God, the greatest need of the human heart is to be saved. Would you stand, please? Heavenly Father, God, we always give an invitation. The prayer today was that you would touch our hearts. The prayer today would be that you would stir us. The prayer today would be that you would save somebody that needed to be saved. Lord, secure us. May we run to you as the great shepherd. The song says, have thine own way. I beg you to have your own way. Move, I pray, in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.